Good evening, everyone. Um, as you could probably tell from the uh, background chimes, we have reached the witching hour. So <clears throat> we can get started this evening. Uh, all righty. So Friday night, seven o'clock, we're back here for soaring. Let's get going. I've got to get my my screen up. There we go. Okay. All righty. So we are on March 8th. This is a speed to fly seminar. Um, we've got four more after this uh, every other Friday until the 3rd of May. So, so if you are interested these are recorded and they're available on the ssa website uh, remember to go to the members website uh, to access it log in and then you'll have a uh, my page my home page news and resources and then webinars if you click on the webinar title you get the recording and if you click on the slides then you'll get the slide deck in pdf form uh, give it a few days, uh, midweek or so, uh, next week, and it should be ready. Uh, one of the things with this evening's topic is this one will not be completely understood the first time through, probably more so than any of the others. So please download and review the materials uh, because it's, like I say, it's a little more complex. So we want to thank the SSA and Frank Whiteley in particular for uh, making the software available and being our uh, our uh, presentation manager. We really appreciate that. We have some uh, uh, BFS -S folks that are part of the FAA's uh, safety team, Coy Snyder, Alice Palmer, and Mark Palmer. These folks make it possible uh, to get these uh, seminars eligible for wings credit. If you registered for the seminar with your WINGS user ID, the credit will be applied over the next few days. The FAA does have guidelines which allows the online seminars to count for WINGS credit, but only the live seminar is eligible for credit. The other one is we have uh, several folks online as panelists who are gonna answer questions in the background and uh, for those that should be brought out to a more broad, uh, more broadly to the group, uh, we'll have a question and answer period towards the end of the session. I have several <clears throat> folks here that I need to say thank you to. John Cochran created a Speed to Fly webinar uh, probably at least five years ago now. There's a link, all these links work. I checked them today. Use these resources. John created the Speed to Fly webinar that was the genesis for this webinar. Uh, Wings and Wheels has a series of articles that they publish. Uh, you can subscribe to them and they've had, uh, they've got a good one on, some good ones on Speed to Fly. And then Paul Remdy at uh, Cumulus Soaring has a Polar Explorer spreadsheet. Uh, the link there is directly to the spreadsheet so that you can download it. Uh, it's a good spreadsheet. It's got a lot of data in it. Uh, like everything that's out on the web, you know, don't don't bet your life on it, but it's got good data in it. For all but one of the graphs in this presentation, you can recreate them for your aircraft using Paul's spreadsheet. So I highly recommend that. I've gone through it a bunch of times and I like the way he built it. Another person that I really have to give a special acknowledgement when we come down to starting to talk about uh, more in-depth of flying cross-country, and that's John Campbell. Uh, his love was working with youth, teaching, and I think it could easily be said that he lived for soaring. In the 1990s, John and I both taught at colleges on the Auraria campus in downtown Denver, and after class, we would sit in his office and talk about soaring. John signed me off for my solo uh, for a winch launch. Uh, in 1969, he was in Hawaii. He was 15 years old, and he was in Hawaii getting his glider license. And I was 16 and trying to figure out how to get my driver's license. 
So that uh, so soaring and flying was just you know that was his life. Give you an idea, he founded the founded the Collegiate Soaring Association. He's the reason the SSA Junior World Championship team program exists. And John, along with a gentleman by the name of Jack Bushman, are the reason the modern CAP Youth Glider program exists in Colorado. Here's a little thing on there. We this is one of those that we would hash around in the evening, looking at a search radius. Somewhere around 20 to 1, cross country becomes consistently possible. At 30 to 1, it becomes likely. And at 40 to 1, it becomes close to certain. And that was just one of those little things that, you know, was probably an off the cuff for one of the both of us. And it just hung with me. For tonight's session, it is the longest in the series. Expect at least two and a half hours. I apologize to the folks on the East Coast. Some background. In this year's first session, is, uh, the intro to cross country, we discussed the training approach utilizing the proving grounds, which is developed by the members of the QNIM Gliding Club up in uh, Calgary, Alberta. The BFSS imp implementation of this approach uses a simple four leg task with turn points on a five mile nautical, five nautical mile radius from the airport as a racetrack. The, uh, and this is in the proving grounds. This task is roughly 50 kilometers plus the distance from the airport to the start and finish point, making a total of about 70 kilometers. This is the first cross country flying most of our members are exposed to. The gliders used have been a K-21, a PW-5, and an AC-4C Russia. All three of these gliders have a best L over D of 30, over 30 to one. And for simplification, we considered them all to be 32 to one gliders. From there, using the guidance for the SSA bronze badge, we established altitude and wind rules based on a 16 to one glide ratio, reduce the glide ratio by half. This approach allowed the pilots to concentrate on flying navigation with simple hard deck to turn and head back to the airport. The proving ground tasks include a task two that we have that's on roughly 117 kilometers and a task three that's at roughly 165 kilometers. Both tasks are triangles with a common start and finish location. Task three shares two of its turn points with task two, and it also provides a silver distance badge flag. Um, and we've had at least one member to get their silver distance by flying that task. We've had multiple members fly the proving uh, the racetrack, and we've had several members fly task two. So this is this is something that we're using in our intro program. The approach allows, you know, with the going from proving ground to task two to task three provides a controlled expansion of the flying pilots flying area and development of their skills and the altitude and wind rules are relaxed, allowing, for instance, on task two and task three, a performance to be based on a 24 to one glide ratio. Okay, now we offer the opportunity for mentored flights in a K-21 with an experienced cross country pilot in our K-21, the mentored flights are utilizing the proving ground tasks. And so this allows our new cross country pilot to see firsthand the, the turn points in the area they'll be flying over. This it dovetails very nicely with the new SSA cross country training program. So um, in addition to the work that we did in session one, session two, the air data, airspeed, altimeter, and variometers, and session three, intro to portable lighting computers also underlies all of this. So the uh, so both most of what we're going to discuss, it's interesting. I learned years ago in my first glider, and then somehow I managed to forget a bunch. And so then I had to rediscover it. And the genesis behind that was John Cochran's presentation. And looking at the course purpose, all right, we're going to be talking about a philosophical discussion of speed to fly. Hopefully we've got a good uh, a good understanding of speed to fly by the time we're done, or at least by the time you've reviewed it a few times. And we're going to illustrate how to use speed to fly. However, this is not about racing a record climb. In this session, we're still addressing the needs of early cross country pilot with the goal of helping these pilots move to an intermediate or higher level of cross country flying. So that has that requires an understanding of glider performance and how to apply that knowledge in flight to in flight decision making. 
the training wheel rules we use up to starting to introduce these concepts, uh, you know, with the proving grounds. Then as you move into this, this is going to give the pilots the ability as they gain the experience and especially as they move on to their own aircraft and or in partnerships and stuff like that to set those rules at an appropriate level for their, their aircraft and their abilities, as opposed to just having it set as a hard deck by the club. Understanding how speed to fly works and you're on your way to longer cross-country flights. Now we are talking about decision-making. And so the problems in decision-making is we can have missing or erroneous data the transformation of that data into information can be flawed. The information that we have can be incomplete. In fact, Speed to Fly is built on the thing of, on the concept of incomplete information. And so what we have is we have decision-making with uncertainty. So we're coming full circle again. It's, you know, we, we're making decisions with uncertainty. Speed to Fly, <clears throat> Came forward with Paul McCready. I'm not, you know, he had many accomplishments in his life. I'm only highlighting his, some of his soaring related accomplishments and specifically the bottom two bullets where he came up with the concept of optimized flight between thermals, which became known as McCready's speed theory of speed to fly. We also call it McCready theory. And then in support of that, he developed a speed to fly cockpit aid. So that was the McCready speed ring. And it was based on the glider sync rate at different air speeds. And, you know, you could use it to help you make decisions depending on the conditions. Now, the thing with McCready's theory, it was contest focused. So the first thing that you have to remember is the contra contest competition in general, the contests are an abstraction of real life. You know, for instance, the people that race cars, they race on a very controlled, in a very controlled environment. And that's an abstraction of us just driving around or playing games with our friends on the road. So his purpose was to improve, improve his cross-country speed. Uh, he was trying to optimize the non-climbing phases of flight. He had a limited number of parameters because we're back in the 50s when we're talking about this. Basically, he was working short-term goals, thermal to thermal. His uh, expectations were quantitatively driven and his aircraft had limited performance and had very limited ability to affect the mass of the aircraft so it couldn't be ballasted up. That was just something that didn't happen back then. So basically uh, his model assumes roughly equal climb and glide split. And his uh, short-term goal as McCready number, uh, basically, you know, he was talking about the expected lift in the next thermal. And the first question everyone asks is how do you know? And the answer to that question is you don't. It's a guess based on what you've seen for the day and what you see along the course line. In modern speed to fly, we're evolving this uh, casual cross-country flying because con contests have become less important to the overall soaring population. We're seeing less and less participation overall in the contest. Of course, it could be because we've diluted this thing with, you know, many, many classes now instead of just one class. But all of our goal is to improve our cross-country speed. You know, and by improve it, I mean, we want to fly fast enough to achieve today's goal. So, you know, how much of the soaring day do I use for a 50 kilometer flight and how much of the soaring day do I need to use for a 500 kilometer flight? So basically, you know, we want to improve our cross-country speed to meet our, day, our day's goals. Again, we're optimizing the non-climbing phase of flight. We do have equipment that supports a broader range of parameters. We have two complementary goals. We have long-term goals, which are generally the overall day, 
and we have short-term goals, which is generally thermal to thermal. In general, we are starting to look at this. Uh, we're doing a lot of with the computers we have on board the aircraft. We're using a lot of quantitative data, but our expectations are, when I talk to folks about this, our expectations are more qualitatively driven. So when I say I want to fly faster, I didn't say I want to fly 20 knots faster. When I say I want to go further, I didn't say I wanted to go, you know, 200 kilometers further. The other thing that um, has evolved with this different look at speed to fly is adding a safety adaptation, especially for uh, final glide. Because the key is, is that most of us would rather not land out today. When we're looking at interthermal speed to fly, okay, total drag is the overall aircraft's polar. So our total drag is the sum of the parasitic drag and the sum of the lift-induced drag. And you can see how it varies over the flight velocity. And what we're measuring is the drag force. For most of us that are, you know, if you're not an aeronautical engineer, then the simplification is the limit over here on the left side, on the low speed side, is when the glider stalls. The limit over here on the right hand side is V and E. Now, as we look at this overall composite curve, the total curve, it starts to look familiar. If I take the drag force over here, on the y-axis, that can be converted to a vertical velocity. So if we do a translation on the vertical axis from force to vertical velocity, the graph moves from quadrant one, which is what we do most of our graphing in, most of, the, most of us non-mathematicians do our graphing in, to quadrant four in the Cartesian plane, and we get a curve that looks like this. In this case, we still have airspeed on the x-axis, but now we have sink rate on the y-axis, okay? So this is a very simple or a simplification of that total drag curve. Like I say, now it's converted for vertical velocity. Uh, the left side generally is uh, uh, you know, we're generally talking about either stall or possibly uh, being more useful for us. The left side is might be the minimum sink speed. The right side turns out to be very often uh, the max useful is somewhere around six knots vertical. So somewhere in this range right here where I'm moving the uh, cursor back and forth. And really, because if you start looking at the, uh, you know, you're starting to get up well into the yellow arc, if not all the way up into uh, V and E range, depending on the vintage of your glider. Okay. So again, you have to remember when we're looking at these things, we're modeling. So from a pilot's perspective, in most cases, anything to the right of a decimal point is uh, unimportant. Uh, I'm not going into the math behind these graphs. If you want to play with that, go get Paul's spreadsheet and you can get some mathematical insight as to the relationships in there. Uh, this is often modeled as a quadratic equation that comes from Helmut Reichman's cross-country soaring. Um, and again, we're basically using a portion of the curve generally from about min sink on the left to the airspeed corresponding to six knots down on the right so generally well up into the yellow arc. There are some differences. Uh, if you've got a flapped glider, the right-hand portion of the curve is flatter. It doesn't drop off as rapidly. Non-flap gliders will have a tendency to show a steeper curve on the right-hand side. Uh, if you compare a 1980s glider, uh, this example is a Ventus B. Uh, if you were to compare that with an ASG 29, the overall curve shifts up slightly, 
and the right hand side gets flatter over here on this side. Okay, that's the difference in the technology. Unballasted. The uh, this is a dry polar, so it's unballasted. If we have a ballasted polar, then this polar will move down slightly and it will move to the right slightly. Okay. And you'll see that uh, later on in some of the other charts. There are gliders out there that have uh, their airfoils give them really strange polars and they don't match a quadratic representation, but this representation gets us close enough to make some decisions. You know, basically, you go back to the old adage about modeling is that all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. It isn't perfect. It's good enough. If you go back and look in the articles about Dick Johnson's uh, analysis on uh, performance of aircraft, the amount of scatter when he measured the data, the amount of scattered in the data is impressive. So the fact that he was able to line up a curve and get something that looks like a polar is very interesting. Now, as we look at this, if I draw a line from the origin, so zero airspeed, zero vertical speed, so zero horizontal speed, zero vertical speed, and we draw it so that it's tangent to the polar, so it's going to touch the polar in a spot. When we do that, what we get <clears throat> is we get a, we, there's the dot, that's where the tangent is. And what that does is that identifies the point on the polar where the best glide is obtained. Okay. We can also draw back to the left to the vertical axis. And that's going to give us the, uh, uh, that's going to give us the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the sink rate. So, now, so what that gives us is if we take the best glide speed and we divide it by the sink rate, we get the glide ratio. So in this case, we've got a 43 to one glide ratio for this aircraft. Now, if you fly at best glide, what is your cross country speed? One of the things that uh, Paul McCree observed is if he said, I had an average two knot climb in all my climbs today. He looked at it and so he drew a line from his best uh, best L over D speed up to the two knot vertical because that was his average climb. And then he looked where across the X axis and his observation was that his cross country speed would likely be about in this case 32 and a half knots. And so the thing that he was determined at that point is that basically he was spending 39% of his time climbing. Okay, for most of us, when we first start flying, if we spend, you know, when we first start our cross country attempts, our goal is to get under 50% climbing. Okay. But now, if we take a look at this, if we start with a two knot average day and we fly this glider at its best L over D, how far can we go? You know, for an hour, okay, we can get 32 and a half nautical miles. For nine hours, we could get up to almost 300 nautical miles. Okay, what I want you to look at is uh, hour three. Okay, so this is a typical contest day is three to four hours long. So if we were to fly our best L over D speed, we would only go about 197 nautical miles or 130 nautical miles for three to four hours. Okay, contests routinely go 200 and, 215 to 270 nautical miles. So obviously they aren't flying best L over D. Okay. In the first class, I made a comment that your first uh, 500 or your first 300 K, so 162 nautical miles, will take you about five hours. Well, guess what? There's where the number comes from. So if I fly my first 300 K flight 
at my best L over D speed. And in this case, it's a Venice B with the best L over D speed of uh, 53 knots. It's going to take, and I got 39% of my uh, time thermally. Then in this case, I am going to, it's going to take me five hours to fly the flight. Okay. So if I took off at a, uh, you know, so that that's, so if I took off about noon, I'd be back about five o'clock. Now, if I wanted to do a 500K flight, which is about 270, so 70 nautical miles. So down here, we would be eight plus hours. And so trying to fly a 500K flight at your best L over D speed, again, in this case, 53 knots, it would be eight plus hours on course. So if I took off at 11 in the morning, there was thermals working and I could actually get out on course, I would be back somewhere around seven o'clock at night. Okay. My first 300K flight was around five hours. It was not in a Venice V. And my first 500K flight took six and a half hours. So in about the year or year and a half in between those two flights, I improved my cross-country speed between my first 300K and my first 500K by a tremendous amount. Now, the goal of McCready's theory was to improve cross-country speed in a contest setting. So we're gonna fly, but we wanna fly faster than best L over D, best flight speed. His theory identified how fast based on the glider's performance. This theory is tactically focused. He's dealing with thermal to thermal. What's the next light thermal likely to be? How fast can I fly and still get there and then use that thermal? As we move through this, we're gonna be talking more of what kind of day is it, not just the next thermal. So there's two things to keep in mind as you go searching about information on the 3D theory. The speed range between the stall and V and E was much less in 1950 than it is in a modern fiberglass glider. For instance, if you go to a first generation Phoebus, the first generation Phoebus fiberglass gliders, their V and E was 108 knots. Okay. Maybe it's 108 miles an hour. I've just forgotten that right now, but very low compared to what we have today. Uh, I mean, the V&E on my uh, ASH 26 is 146 knots. The other one is, is the mass of a modern glider can be buried over a much larger range than a typical 1950 glider. Most of the 1950 gliders didn't have ballast. Uh, the LAC-12, I could put 50 gallons in her, so 400 pounds of ballast. Okay. So now as we look at this, so our speed to fly at, uh, at 53 knots, if we assume, uh, you know, that's our best. So if we move up, um, we're thinking about this uh, in terms of sync. So if we were flying consistently in one knot sync, we'd like to fly faster. If we were two knots, three knots, four knots, five knots, okay? Now we normally think of this when we're doing the graphing from our initial flight training, that we're looking at that as that's the speed to fly at higher speeds because the sink that we're flying through. Okay, how about though, if we look at that zero through five and we rethink it, we don't think of it as the sink we're flying through. We think of it as the potential lift, the expected lift. So at that point, now we start to see where the McCready number comes from. So that's the expected lift value in the next thermal and the tangent point indicates the speed to fly to get to the next thermal. So, if it was, if we were expecting the next thermal to be zero, at which point, why are we leaving here? That would be 53 knots. At one, it's 63 knots. At two, it's 72 knots. At three, it's 80 knots. At four, it's 97 knots. And at five, it's 94 knots. Okay. Now, again, that's a Ventus B. So in this case, we can put glide ratios on there. So this little chart has glide ratios on it. 
And so our traditional strategy would be for interthermal speed and our modern, our modern usage is we're gonna use it for interthermal speed, but we're also gonna add a strategy for using this information for a safety glide or what most of us would think of as a final glide. But the reason I wanna keep the term safety glide in there is because this also covers if we were flying over an unlandable area on course, not just coming back into the home home airport. And the key to this, the enabling technology for this is our modern Varios with speed to fly information in the Vario and our cockpit computers. So one of the things to look at with this, let's take a look at a polar with our best glide tangent from McCready 4. So that yields a uh, Best glide speed of 87 knots. We'll have a glide ratio of about 29 to 1. That you know was in the previous slide. And our average, if we use McCready's observation, is going to be maybe 50 knots. And we could expect it, if you play with the calculations, we can expect it to be about 42% climbing. So obviously, we we'll want to do better than that. But that gives you something to work with. Okay, so now, one of the things we're going to slow down by 10 knots, and we're gonna speed up by 10 knots. So if we look at this and we slowed down by 10 knots and we speed it up by 10 knots, what was the impact on our average cross country speed? Not much. You know, at, at least looking at the base numbers, not looking at what we can do to optimize it later, that kind of thing. But notice that if we slow down to, uh, you know, roughly 77 knots or speed it up to roughly 97 knots, at that four knot setting or four McCready setting, our cross country speed, our average cross country speed is still going to be roughly 50 knots. If I were to do the same data over here and bracket, the best L over D speed at 53 knots knows what happens. Okay, so now we're going to go down to 43 knots and up to 63 knots. But notice the crossing points right here. Okay, here's the crossing point that would be our average if we were flying with a McCready 4 and we were flying at our best L over D speed, the aircraft's best L over D speed. And notice when we increased by 10 knots, it went up a little bit. And when we decreased it by 10 knots, it went down a bunch, okay? So one of the things with using McCready theory on your cross-country flying is you want to get out of this highly curved portion of the performance curve. You want to get over here where the performance curve is flatter, okay? So that way, variations in your speed, even up into the range of 10 knots, doesn't really have much impact over your overall achieved speed. Of course, that also does tell you something else. Uh, thermaling and then running like mad may not be a real good way to increase your average speed. You see what I mean right there? Okay, now, <clears throat> the uh, one of the things to remember is that almost all speed to fly varios, very few of them have uh, it's a speed director, very few of the speed directors, they're telling you to fly faster or slower. They're not telling you what the speed you should fly. So you fly a block speed. You can set your thing up so that it will give an indication on many of the variometers. You can set them up so they'll give you an indication. You know, it's fly slower, fly faster, but you can also tell it to be quiet in if you're flying within the uh, speed block, if you've set your speed block, for instance, in this case, plus or minus 10 knots. What this also tells you is don't worry about flying McCready 4.2. I don't care what it calculates to it. If you look at this, you notice that really doesn't matter all that much. One of the things that you will find, though, is that going slow hurts more than going fast helps. Okay. Look at the difference right here. We got a very little increase in our 
average speed by flying faster. We lost a lot on our average cross country speed using this particular analysis. We lost a lot on our cross country speed compared to how much we gained by going faster when we went slower. Okay, now what do you need? All right. What do you need in order to use McCready? You need a total energy variometer. Okay, no stick thermals, please. And you need something that is going to put the aircraft's performance, allow you to relate the aircraft's performance to the variometer. Okay. Don't worry about the white line. That's an artifact from uh, uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so this is the minimum that we need is a total energy variometer. And then in this case, what we all call now the McCready ring. So this is in a duo discus XL. The values on the ring, you notice they're nonlinear. There's a bigger gap between 150 to 160. Everything on here is in uh, metrics. So this is kilometers. Everything in, on here is in uh, kilometers per uh, kilometers per hour. Okay. So 160, notice the difference is larger than 140. That's because the curve itself that this is modeling on this round ring is nonlinear. Okay. The triangle, this McCready ring is set for one knot conditions. So they're saying it's one knot. We come down and we're sitting a little over one knot down and the pointer is pointing at 130 or I'm sorry, kilometers per hour. So it's pointing uh, a little over uh, one meter per second down. That's pointing at the 130 kilometers. And you notice over here, they're flying 130 kilometers an hour. Okay. When the glider slows down in the thermal, if you've got it set at one and you're, you're in thermaling up here, when the climb drops below one, that's your indication that it's time to leave the thermal. If you uh, if you're running along in the uh, in lift, you've got it set. You're, you're running along. You've got it set for plus one, and it says 130, and you're running 130. Okay. If we get uh, better lift, in other words, the needle goes up, then it's going to tell you to fly slower. What's the thing we're always taught? Slow down and lift. If the lift gets worse, it goes down here to two, it says fly faster. So slow down and lift, speed up in sync. The key with this setup, the speed to fly, is it's giving you an indication of what speed to go to for the conditions that you're flying in. If you see one of these rings and it's got two uh, layers of numbers around it. The uh, inner layer will be for unballasted, so dry, and the outer ring of numbers will be the air speeds for fully ballasted. Now, in our modern cockpits, uh, you know, the discus, duo discus XL is not an ancient aircraft, but as we can get better and better equipment, to present information to us in the cockpit. So if we could have a speed to fly vario with an audio and then some more useful information, okay? Again, the example that's on the screen is in metric units. Uh, but basically that 2.8 meters per second is roughly five knots and this 129 kilometers per hour is roughly 70 knots. And uh, you notice that the average is, or the uh, vario is sitting up here at about two and a half. So they're sitting at about five and a half knots of lift with this presentation. What Dave, do we have? I have uh, two questions for you. Can I interrupt you? Sure. Uh, they're relevant for what we were just talking about. Are McCready rings always tuned to the polar of the ship they are installed in? Yes. Okay. They don't, they're not valid under any other circumstances. Second question, is the sink rate used based on what is seen in the thermal or the average in the flight? Is the sink rate used? 
You're talking about where you would set it right here, I'm assuming. I think so. Okay. Uh, McCready's theory was you use the uh, average of your last thermal for your setting for the speed to fly to your next thermal. So in this case, if we followed that rule, they came out of their last thermal and the average of that thermal was one, was one and so they set the, the key to one and that gave them the speed to fly interthermal based on the conditions they're currently flying in, which in this case is a little over a negative one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what's this instrument telling us? The red needle, this guy right here, that's your instantaneous vario. Or if you have uh, uh, netto or relative netto, that's giving you that information. That's your instantaneous read, okay? The little red diamond right here is the average for the last 20 to 30 seconds, okay? So whether you're cruising or whether you're in a thermal, there's your average. The blue triangle is your McCready setting. The red arc that's coming around right here, that's the range that you've seen in this thermal. Okay. You can tell what mode the uh, Vario thinks it's in by looking over here. I am drawing a circle around a little indicator that is a circle with an arrowhead. That means that they are in thermal mode. And what they're displaying as the additional numbers on the air, on the uh, instrument is this is the average for the Vario, so the red diamond, and this is the true airspeed, okay? The green T that's right here I'm not sure what this is set for in this example, but it could be set up to show if this is showing the average for the last 20 to 30 seconds, the red diamond, this green T could be programmed to show the overall average for the entire thermal since you pulled up into the thermal. Okay. The uh, one thing that you have to be careful of with the speed to fly vario, it does not know your aircraft's limitations. It does not have a stall speed. It does not have the yellow arc. It does not have V and E. So when it's commanding you, this is your command bars over here. So in this case, this is saying, you know, slow down. You want to climb more. Okay. Um, you have to be careful with the speed to fly command bars because there's nothing in a speed, most speed to fly varios that has anything about your aircraft's performance, your aircraft's limitations, other than the polar information. And so it can command you, you know, it'll happily command you to go to redline. Okay. You have to maintain uh, cognizance over those decisions. The other thing that we run into. So if we switch over from looking at the instrumentation that we have in front of us, now let's look at some in information about the gliders themselves. The Venice B is a, is a uh, lapped glider. So if you take a look, you can see that the curve in this region, I said it would go down and it would flatten out here. So this is, this came down. So at the, uh, minimum sink, it's going to be a little higher sink rate because the mass is up and you notice that the curve is flatter out here. So the, the speeds and the sink rates vary when the glider is heavy. So if we look at it at uh, the best L over D for the weight, we are at 53 knots, you know, up here at uh, 760 pounds. If we come over here to the max gross for this particular vintage glider at 1100 pounds, notice that our best L over D speed went up to uh, 64 knots. If we uh, look at a McCready 2 setting, 
we went to 72 knots. And over here, we went to 84 knots. And if we go to a McCready 4 setting, we end up at 87 knots. And we end up at 99 knots. Now, there's a horizontal yellow line right here. And it looks like it's showing up OK on my on the screen you're looking at. Notice that this is like 1.2 knots. In this case, it's 1.5 knots. At McCready 2 over here, it is roughly 2 knots. At McCready 2 over here, it's only 2.2. And at McCready 4 dry, this is at 3 knots. And at McCready 4 over here for fully ballasted, it's 3.1 knots. So you can increase the performance of the aircraft by increasing the mass of the aircraft. Now, the key is, is that you may not be able to thermal as slowly. Uh, it may not climb as well. But when you're on a flat out run, you know, the inner thermal space, you know, heavy is better. So there's the uh, uh, there's those data points in a table form for you. If you want to look at it overlaid, okay. So those were side by side. Let's overlay the two polars. So the darker polar is dry, and the lighter polar is wet. So here you can directly see a comparison as to what happens between McCready 0, 2, and 4 with the airspeeds. Okay. So that's what mass does for you. Now, McCready's question, historically, what's the lift likely to be in the next thermal? Okay. And the, uh, the answer is it depends, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But uh, if we were to say that this thermal is probably a good indicator of what the next thermal is, remember, if you invest in the stock market, they always say past performance is not an indication of future performance. But that's exactly what we're doing with this. We're saying that our most recent performance might be a pretty good indicator of what our next one will be. And so, therefore, we're going to roll the dice and take that value. Okay. But that's all the McCready uh, was, was working with was based on what was the last thermal and what's it look like between now and the next thermal? What do I see out in front of me? Today, uh, I find that when I talk to folks about this, they're looking at more uh, what's the day look like? And how do I characterize my current circumstances against the day? And what is the minimum, you know, totally smooth, no search time. You know, it's easy to center lift that I would stop to take right now. And then uh, the other one, especially if we're looking for final glide, is how do I characterize the glide I use to get home? Um, I found uh, I was flying out at Nephi a number of years ago when I was about 50, 60, maybe 70 miles uh, south, southwest of uh, the airport. And my computer overheated and it went, you know, it just clicked off. Nothing was going to turn it back on. It just overheated and it, it said the battery's too hot and it shut down. So I have a nice black screen. But I had a characterization of the day. Uh, you know, it was basically if I was above 12,000 feet, it was run like a scalded cat. The thermals were, you know, somewhere four to eight knots. Um, the tops were up around 16 to 17,000 feet. I could look to the northeast and I could see uh, Mount Nebo as a little bitty bump on the horizon. Plus I had I-15 on the ground and I had the ridge line that I was over that was plus or minus I-15. It was between I-15 and the desert. So I had plenty of clues to help me with navigation. Uh, of course, the task I was flying was done because I had no, I didn't have uh, the uh, the computer because you know the task 
while they may have been defined by no, known landmarks to the people that flew the area, for those, for those of us that were visiting, it was a little X on our screen, right? You know, course line turned at the turn point. But by characterizing the day and having a feel for how the day was, and then using that old thing of dividing, you know, I, like I said, I have above 12,000 feet, run like a scalded cat. Below 12,000 feet, find something. And if I was down, uh, you know, if I was down below about, uh, say, 8,000 feet, it was take every, take anything because the terrain out there, if you're not over the ridge lines, the terrain is uh, five to 6,000 feet. So, you know, you get down to a point and you say, no, I'll take anything. Okay. So the Mercuity question we asked today, we're, we're, I think we're flying a little bit different. Uh, I could be wrong, but when I talk to folks, they seem to be characterizing the day and then characterizing what they've got right now. And then the other, the other question is, is that, Given how I'm running right now, what would it take for me to stop? You know, would it take three knots? Would it take two knots? Would it take five knots? Okay, because I'm now making decisions based on my characterization. Now, go see John's webinar. He's got, a, this is a synopsis, basically. He says, climb better. In fact, he says, climb better, climb better, climb better. Okay. Avoid bad lift. Don't stay in bad lift. Okay. There's no reason to wait for bad thermal to turn good. It probably isn't. He also says, don't go fishing. You know, just don't wander aimlessly trying to find something, you know, kind of like casting a lure out onto a lake and just, you know, starting over here at uh, 10 o'clock and then casting at 12 and then casting at 2, hoping you'll find something. Don't turn around and go back. And if you're up nice and high and it's high speed running, don't thermal up there. If you can fly in lift, fly in the lift. Cruise somewhat faster. If you go and check the flights on the OLC, the long fast flights have thermaling as a percentage of the flight time in their teens, something like 15 to 20% of the flight time. So one of the things you wanna do is you wanna check your thermaling at percentage. You're likely to find it's in the 30 to 40% range. Um, so your first improvement, you got three rules. Like I said, John's three rules, first three rules, climb better, climb better, climb better. Efficiency matters. So your assignment every time you hit a thermal is to truly core the thermal. Okay. You avoid, you know, weak lift hurts more than strong lift helps. So avoid the bad lift. You know, if you said, okay, I've got an average of two knots, and then I hit 10 knots, and half of my climb was in two knots, and half of my climb is in 10 knots. Okay. Of course, everybody just added them to 12 divided by two and said, oh, the average for the thermal was six knots. Actually, the average for your first thousand feet at two knots was five minutes. Your average for the next thousand feet at 10 knots was three minutes. So if you spent six minutes in that thermal for a 2000 foot gain, your average was 3.3 .3 knots. If you could find two thermals at four knots, you were better off. Okay. Now, one thing to remember though, you know, nobody probably hurt themselves by uh, climbing in smooth lift at five knots. So what are the things? Uh, I have one question I think fits in here. Yeah. On a thermal to thermal basis, is there any consideration on thermal separation? Um, yeah, that's the uh, that's when you come into the thing of your uh, your cross country bands, your uh, your height bands. So uh, my description from Nephi, when I was at fourteen thousand feet. I didn't really care how far it was between thermals as long as I stayed above 12. When I dropped below 12, I started thinking about, okay, uh, how long will I continue before I grab a thermal now? Okay, so the answer to that question is it really depends. If it's a strong day and you're up nice and high and you're running pretty fast, then you're not particularly concerned about the distance between thermals. Um, 
one of the old rules, and I don't know where it came from, and you have to remember that the old rules were, you know, guesses as much as anything, is the narrower and taller the thermal, the farther they were apart. But the other one is, is that if you're flying a glider, uh, you know, that's running in the range at the speed that you're flying, if you're flying a glider that's running well above 30 to 1, you've got a long ways in between thermals. You can, you know, you can, you can work with a long distance between thermals. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, now, one of the things that you want to do is don't hang around in bad lip. Now, we're talking about being up where you're cruising. And we're trying to improve cross-country speed and we're trying to use the McCready to help us with this, okay? If, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if you're 2000 AGL, it's a soft day and the best you're gonna find is one and a half, then you take one and a half and you climb up and then you see if it improves as you go up. And if you've got some markers that will help you and you stair step your way, okay? But if you're, you know, 5,000 AGL and you're bombing along and you hit a thermal, okay, if you set your, uh, if you set your McCready for two or three in the thermal, because that's going to be when you say I'm going to leave, that's not saying what the average of the thermal is. You're saying when it gets down to two or three, I'm going to leave. When the average drops below the McCready, leave now, okay? That was your decision. And, you know, you didn't make that kind of decision if you were in dire circumstances. Okay. The other thing is when you're running along, okay, your reaction time, think about this. At 60 knots, you're traveling at roughly 100 feet per second. At 90 knots, you're traveling at roughly 150 feet per second. So if the thermal is 400 feet in diameter and you take three seconds to decide you may be too late to get back to that thermal, okay? So if your lift is not increasing at 60 degrees off course, don't keep going around. Go ahead and bank it back and keep going, okay? So that's your, you know, that's that's some of the ways to improve it. The other one is, is that when we talk about that magical 400 foot diameter thermal, okay? So if I hit it head on at 90 knots, I'm going to traverse that whole 400 feet in about two and a half seconds. Okay. If I just hit the corner of it, I might not, you know, I might feel it, but I'm going to blow through that in way less than a second. So like I said, if you take three seconds to decide that you're going to turn uh, based on the feeling that you're getting in your butt and what you're seeing in the needles uh, in your cocktail, you may be way too late on that thermal. So the faster you're flying, probably the stronger the thermal has to be, and you pretty well have to do, you pretty well have to get near center punching. The other improvement on your cross-country speed, and this is what I was alluding to just now, or just in response to the question, you don't stop if you don't need lift. Now, there's a psychological aspect of this. You've got confidence. Will there be lift ahead and will you find it? Okay, so that's weather experience, that's your confidence in your characterization of the day and your confidence in the characterization of the thermals that you've seen so far. The uh, other one is that you have to deal with, and you'll find this in uh, G. Dale's, uh, I think it's in his volume three, and this is dealing with the psychology in the cockpit, and that is, why am I scared or why am I nervous? Okay. So that's one of the things that as you are improving your cross-country skills, you have, to, uh, you have to deal with your reaction to the stimulus in the cockpit and come up with ways to control your anxiety. And if your anxiety has run away, can come up with methods that allow you to regain control over your anxiety. Uh, and I recommend G. Dale's uh, uh, it's his Soaring Engine series, and it's in and that discussion is in volume three. The other one is, as you're bombing along and you're saying, I don't need to take, you know, do I need to take the thermal? Do I need to take the thermal? And that is, how often have you landed out 
from this position or in this kind of weather? You know, is, is your concern warranted? The third one is you need to cruise faster. You know, we've already pointed out on the performance of the glider on the glider performance curves that cruising faster make is is a good approach. You're making general better strategic decisions, and that's based on the characterization of the day and generalized McCready theory. Okay, so how far should I be able to get? A couple of years ago, I was uh, out over the eastern plains of Colorado, and I was headed back to the home airport, and I stumbled onto a convergence line, and this was far enough long ago that uh, the convergence line in SkySight and having it in the cockpit wasn't available to me, and so I was watching the, the cloud formations, you know, as I was headed back, I got 75 nautical miles in a straight line at uh, between 75 and 80 knots without turning. You need to look outside for the energy lines. And that's one of those that, that's where you pick up the skill and talk to the pilots that you fly with about how to read the sky in your part of the country. What does it mean when you see a convergence line? How does it manifest itself? The other thing with that is to remember is with all the equipment we have in the cockpit, SkySight and RASP are models. They are not reporting the current conditions. They're reporting the best guess of what the conditions might be like where you are at this time. Look outside. So that's your hints on how to fly faster. Okay, this slide has got several things on it. First off, the color com the colors on there are tied to performance information. Uh, remember, all of your airspeed limitations are in indicated airspeed. Don't keep bouncing back and forth to uh, trying to bounce back and forth to. Uh, true airspeed and try to do data conversions while you're flying. You've got the markings in the cockpit. And if you have a glider that is uh, that was certified under CS22, which is the glider certification in uh, ESA, the uh, red line, you have to have something in the cockpit that derates your red line indication based on altitude for the indicated airspeed on your airspeed indicator. So remember, you're dealing with indicated airspeed. In my Venice B, the yellow arc begins at 108 knots. So the yellow boxes, when I'm looking at those uh, glide speeds, these two columns, this column and this column, those yellow boxes indicate that I'm operating up in the yellow arc, okay? The uh, now mine's is 108. I'm not going to quibble about the difference between 106 and 108 because you're going to bounce around. All right. So that's the first one. The blue arc is, uh, you know, the blue arc is my. Uh, I need to be in negative flaps. Okay, so I, I'm required to be in negative flaps above 87 or 86 knots. So that means I'm going to be flying either in minus one in my Venice, either minus one, minus two, or S to be flying those speeds. Okay, so those you have to keep track of. The green, okay, that's firmly in the green arc with no problem. The blue is firmly in the green arc with no problem. The yellow is in the yellow arc, uh, I don't fly in the yellow arc. That's just my rule, okay? Catch me sometime and I'll give you the story behind it, okay? So keep the airspeed in, uh, limitations in mind. Don't blindly follow your computer to higher airspeeds, especially at higher altitude. Now, when I say higher altitude, if you fly at a 2,000 foot field elevation, your air, you know, your airfield is a 2,000 foot MSL, Field elevation, 
So somewhere between 10 and 12,000 feet is probably a higher altitude for you. I fly from a field that's a 7,000 foot MSL field elevation, and we often reach the Class A boundary, you know, 18,000 MSL. Excuse me. The one thing you have to keep in mind, uh, especially for the European gliders, and it's your obligation to know from your operating limit or your uh, flight manual, and that is that you are often operating well above the altitude where the VNE certification was accomplished. And so, therefore, you will have some kind of derating on your airspeed uh, at those higher altitudes. For instance, on my uh, ASH 26, her red line, her certified, the altitude that she was tested at, her red line was 146 knots. At 18,000 feet, that's down between 125 and 130 knots. Okay, so just be sure that you understand the changes with altitude. The computer, uh, the computer doesn't know those numbers and it will happily tell you to go fly that fast. Okay. All righty. So as we look at this, I have McCready numbers on the left. Dry is the first three columns. Wet is the next three columns. Here's our target speeds. And here's the L over D at those target speeds. Okay. And then using that simplified analysis that McCready had for average cross-country speed. So if I'm flying at McCready 4 at 87 knots, and I'm thermaling about, uh, uh, I think it was 40% of the time, I got an L over D of 29 to 1, and I will probably average about 50 knots cross-country speed. Okay. The other thing to look at is when you're looking philosophically at uh, the uh, uh, what do the McCready numbers mean? If I pull down to McCready zero, chances are, and we'll talk about this a little more later, chances are I'm sitting here with an imminent outlanding. If I'm looking at McCready one, I'm desperate. I'm saying I'll take a McCready one thermal. Okay. When I'm at McCready zero, I'm saying I just want to hang on. Okay. At McCready one, I'll take a McCready one thermal. I'm inner thermal. I'll take a McCready one thermal. That says I'm pretty desperate. McCready two for inner thermal indicates that I'm probably being cautious. McCready three starts to get us up into, yeah, I'm probably doing okay. McCready four, yeah, yeah, I'm, that may be a really good day. I'm probably being pretty aggressive. Now, if I'm flying dry, this ripping aggressive might be McCready five, maybe even McCready six. Remember, I've got a rule. I don't go up into the yellow arc, not my playground. Uh, so there's also a little bit of uh, rationale or philosophy over here about how I apply this, basically, uh, that depends on whether I'm flying dry or whether I'm flying wet. Okay. Now, one of the other things that happens uh, that you that you run into when you're using your computer, you're setting the McCready in your, in your computer and you're setting a McCready in your Vario. When you're setting the McCready in your computer, the calculation the computer is giving you uh, is taking into account uh, your wind, the wind and the altitude that you're at. Whereas in the Vario, the Vario, when it's working with the McCready, is just looking at the sink rates, the lift and climb. Okay. One of the things that you will find, though, it's it's kind of interesting. Uh, McCready numbers readily transfer from glider to glider. Uh, the uh, so while L over D, and I don't have feet per mile on this chart, but uh, some of us grew up trying to compute it with feet per mile in our heads because we didn't have computers in the cockpit. I was so glad to get rid of that task and, you know, hand it off to my computer. But when we look at L over D numbers, so McCready, McCready 3, so everything's fine. 
you know, this might be my default setting when I take off in the morning and then as the day improves, I move the number up. Okay. I get more aggressive. The interesting thing is, is that a McCready 4 or McCready 3 and a Nimbus 4 is about the same level of aggressiveness as McCready 3 is in a discus. In other words, yeah, it's a good day. Everything's going fine. Now, the L over D and the feet per mile, you know, the performance is wildly different. But what we're talking about at this point is the philosophical rationale for why I'm in that particular setting. Okay. So those will transfer. Uh, you know, we have a PW5 at our club and I'll jump out of my Venice and go fly the PW5 sometimes, especially in the late fall, you know, when it's not really worth assembling and the PW5 is already assembled in the hangar. And I found this to be true. I'll fly the same uh, McCready numbers, but of course I've told my computer that I'm in a PW5 as opposed to being in a Ventus B. And therefore it's giving me the speeds and all of the, and the distance I can make and all of that stuff based on the PW5. Uh, but I also noticed that, you know, I don't try to fly it as far away from the airport on a, on a soft day as I would fly to Venice. So I, but I thought that was interesting. That was one of the things that came out of uh, John Cochran's discussion about improving your cross country speed. So the McCready number as a philosophical, you know, how do I feel about the day? How do I feel about how things are going? Uh, and so what it boils down to is everything in cross country soaring turns out to be key to McCready values. So what thermals to take? I'm looking for a, you know, a two knot thermal, a three knot thermal, a five knot thermal, how fast to fly, okay? Uh, I'm going to fly from this thermal, assuming the next one's a three knot thermal at McCready three, and, and I'm dry. I'm gonna be flying at 80 knots. I'm gonna fly based on the performance of the last thermal I was in to the next thermal at McCready five. I'm gonna fly at 94 knots, okay? So how fast to fly? So this will give you, it gives us a thing about, uh, you know, the McCready. And then when we tie it back into winds, how aggressively do I go into an upwind turn point? Because now I got to go back and fly against the wind. Uh, how big of a course deviation, you know, um, with the way the day is going and I'm flying at McCready too, uh, is a, you know, a 45 degree course deviation to get to a thermal. Is that better to get to that thermal over there to the right, or should I continue on to the thermal that's ahead of me? It influences it because it's set the speed that I'm flying and the L over D that I'm achieving. Okay. Now, that ties all of this stuff back into looking at stuff inside the cockpit. And one of the things that I do have to mention when, I, when we're playing this game, and that is always look outside first for the answer. If you've got a solution, when you look outside, work with that solution, especially, especially when you're down low, you have to learn how to recognize uh, how far you can glide. Uh, we had a young man that in his first, his first personal glider, and he came back into an airport one day and he made it. There wasn't any problem with it. Okay. Uh, the, I'm not saying that, but he seemed to cross the fence awful low. And I asked because I was at roughly the same stage in my flying career as he was in his, at least in gliders. And I asked, uh, you know, that, that seemed a little low. And he, he said, well, the computer said I could make it. And so one of my mantras that I developed after that conversation is, okay, the computer says I can make it. What do I see when I look outside? And when I do mentoring flights with our, uh, our uh, fledgling cross-country folks, one of the things that I really work hard on is that regardless of what you, what the computer's telling you, what do you see? You know, we're five miles out. We're, uh, you know, we're in a 30 to one glider. We're five miles out and we're 2,500 AGL and we want to get back to the airport at 1,000 AGL. Tell me what you see looking out. Now, for all of you that are experienced pilots, I just described, you know, in a no-win situation, I just described a, uh, oh, 
No problem whatsoever for the beginning cross-country pilot. That is a view that they have probably never observed. And it's something that you need to bring them into gently because it's a shock. So no matter what the computer's telling you, no matter what all of these graphs and tables and everything else say, look outside and see if you see the answer. Dave, okay, I now, a question yeah. here. Mm -hmm. You calculated the average speed flown while using a McCready setting on the polar for the target speed where the tangent line crossed the zero sync axis. Right. Why is the average speed determined at zero sync? That was McCready's observation, and it's a convenient departure point. You know, he, he did that analysis and he said, oh, this this seems to explain what I'm observing. And, uh, you know, it just it's a, a good departure point to examine these topics with. OK, thank you. And my experience is that, especially if I go off and I fly uh, my best L over D speed in my glider, that that speed is just about what I see when I've got about a, a, a 30 or 40 percent thermaling percentage for the flight. So my observation agrees with McCready's observation, but it was his observation, not mine. I just kind of followed along. But I do find that it has a tendency to hold. Okay, now, this is a interesting thing. This is one graph that you can't recreate using Paul's spreadsheet because this came directly from John Cochran's uh, presentation. He developed this theory flying a discus in Illinois, you know, so somewhere, uh, somewhere in a place that, you know, you can fly gliders there. <laughs> of course, I'm teasing. I'm joking. I know there are plenty of clubs back there. In the, but So one of the things that you do is what's the weakest thermal you'll take? And, you know, he's saying that if you make that decision, that's when you would leave. Okay. What's the lift that you would leave? Now, again, like I said, this is based out of uh, flying in the Illinois area. If you're out west, you know, for instance, out here in Colorado, where, you know, we start at 7,000 feet above sea level, some of these values may need to be a little higher. But basically what this is leading to is a stair-step approach. So one of the things that happens is you want to say, as I go higher, the minimum thermal that I want to take increases. So in this case, I'm 4,000. I'm, I'm yeah, let, let's just say this is 4,000 MSL. I want to say I'll take a higher thermal. So in this case, something over three. But if I'm at 3,000, I may take something un, between two and three. Okay. If I'm at 2,000, it's going to be a little over two. But when I'm down here at 1,000, I'm going to take just about anything. You know, a one knotter is going to keep me happy. Okay. And then the idea is, is that if you're at a thousand feet and you're scratching, and so I'm assuming that you're either over your outlanding field and you just aren't ready to throw in the towel and land, you're going to take it a little bit lower and then pull the boards, drop the gear and land, or drop the gear, pull the boards and land, take your pick. That depends on your checklist. But the key is, is that if you're 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 right here now, if that as you climb up in altitude, okay, at some point, let's say you get up here, you're up around 2,000 feet, you've now got a thousand feet to work for work with, and this one is starting to peter out, it's probably time to say, uh, you know, my one knot thermal or, you know, things have improved, it's time to go look for a stronger thermal. Okay, now this is your risk tolerance. This is the circumstances under which your flight's being conducted, the terrain, the day. Uh, you know, are you over trees? Are you over smooth ground? Are you over rocky uh, stream beds? You know, that kind of thing. Okay. 
So, but what you take with this, like for instance, I took a one, I will take a one. As I get up higher, I want to start thinking about taking, you know, go look for a two knot thermal or I get up higher, I wanna look for a three knot thermal, okay? So I might stay in this guy up here and let's say it tops out at about three and I'm no, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm done. When I head off right here, my first thing is I'm going to probably want to try to look for a two or a three knot thermal. And I want to stair step my way up when I find them. Okay. Now, what this means is, is that we play this scheme enough. You start developing this flexible height band. Uh, I use a three level height band. Um, and I get my initial settings out of looking in the models at what the, uh, uh, what the uh, height of the boundary layer is and stuff like that. But we'll talk about weather in a later version, uh, later seminar and uh, for a later session, and I'll have more details there. But so my, I may say, if I'm, if it's a good day, I may say anything below 3000, oh, okay, I'm just going to take something. And, but if I'm between three and six, I'm going to be picky. And if I'm uh, for say three and uh yeah, three and six. And if I'm above six AGL, I'm fat, dumb, and happy, and let's just run, and I'll only take something if it's really, really good. Okay. So that's one of the things that you have to configure, or that you have to consider. Uh, the lower you get, the, uh, the, the lower performance thermal that you're willing to, that you'll, that you will be willing to take. Okay. The, um, <clears throat> One of the things that when we look at this, what does a four to six dot day mean? Well, it doesn't mean, uh, and we'll look at it a little more detail in a, in a couple of slides, but your settings are not at four and six, okay? And you don't necessarily, you know, if you're down here at 3000 feet and you just hopped out of a, let's say you hopped out of a three knot thermal, it, it, was, it was ending you don't necessarily at 3000 feet set your McCready and say, oh, I'm gonna fly McCready three to the next thermal. That might not be a real wise choice. So you don't necessarily always fly McCready, especially when you're down in this lower region, AGL. The, uh, uh, you know, your height bands, my needs and therefore my behaviors when I'm at 18,000 feet over 7,000 foot MSL terrain is very different than my needs and behaviors at 9,000 feet MSL over 7,000 foot MSL terrain. And that's what I've been describing to you. So you don't always fly McCready. Now, I regularly fly an ASK-21, a Ventus B, and an ASH-26. Periodically, I jump in a PW5, okay? That's a pretty wide performance uh, spectrum and a pretty wide uh, set of capabilities. The ground rules that I use in general, okay? I am flying in the Western United States with Western altitudes, okay? And I'm flying a pure glider in this chart. So at 3000 AGL, I'm reducing my McCready setting and making sure there's a landing location, a landable location available. And my thing is find lift. Okay, at 2000 AGL, I'm going to reduce my expectations on the McCready setting. I've got, I've selected a landable location, but I'm still working finding lift. At 1,000 feet AGL, I'm inspecting my landable location. I've given up on playing with McCready at that point. I say reduce it. I've got just, you know, it no longer matters. It probably quit mattering when I went through 2,000 AGL, to be completely honest. And my goal is to find lift. And I am limiting my search area for lift to a good pattern entry point. Okay. So the uh, 
And where we were looking in the previous slide about reducing the McCready setting, and that's what I've got written here, perhaps what I really should be saying is reduce your thermal strength expectation and reduce your pilot aggressiveness setting. Okay. Um, and when I had a LAC-12 uh, and I was down to 1,000 feet AGL, I was really praying I found the lift. I landed that thing out one time and it took, you know, I landed that thing out five miles from the airport in an easy to get to field and it still took eight hours to retrieve the aircraft. So that again, catch me sometime and it makes a halfway decent uh, story. But remember, aviate, navigate, and communicate. Down this low is not somewhere to be playing games. All right, motor glider. Two of my gliders, uh, my Ventus is a Ventus BT and my ASH-26 is an ASH-26E. So the 26 is a self-launcher and the BT is a sustainer. When I'm working uh, this area again, where I say reduce McCready setting, let's just say reduce your lift expectations, I'll take you know, I'm not going to insist on a three knot thermal or a two knot thermal, that kind of thing. Okay. I'm also going to dial back my pilot aggressiveness. So at 3000 AGL, I'm going to reduce my expectation for how strong the lift will be. I'm going to make sure that I've got a landing location available. And the thing that I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to decide if I'm going to use the engine. Is the engine use viable? Uh, there are conditions you can get into. Uh, you know, if it's the end of the day and it's quiet and it's just mild sink, the engine is probably imminently usable almost under any circumstances. If it's the middle of the day and you're caught in, uh, you know, a downwash off of a thunderstorm, you know, five knots down with a turbo or with a, a sustainer engine, it doesn't matter. The engine is not going to do anything for you. Fly the glider. So at 3000 AGL, I decided if using the engine is viable. Then obviously I search for lift. 2000 AGL, same thing that I was doing previously in a pier glider. The 2000 AGL is uh, when I'm going to deploy and start the engine. My ASH 26 has an electric starter. Electric starters don't always work. A plummet to spin that propeller and try to start is probably not going to work. My sustainer is a deploy the engine and dive to spin the engine up. If I'm in practice and the engine is nice and warm, I started it after I took off today and all of those things line up, I can get a start in about 300 feet. That's 300 feet loss until the engine starts and figure another 100 feet for it to warm up, come up and start producing adequate power to affect the situation. If it isn't going to affect the situation, don't play with the engine. Now, if it's cold, I'm out of practice, that start can easily take a thousand feet. So now I'm down at a thousand feet. Okay. I'm reducing my expectation on finding lift. I have ceased attempting to use the engine in any way, shape, or form. If I am lucky and I can put it away, I do so. If I can't put it away, that engine out on my Ventus BT that has a glide ratio of 43 to 1 with the engine out is an 18 to 1 glider. I'm landing. And guess what? The situation in the 26 with a windmilling engine isn't much better. Okay, only there I'm coming down from 48 or 50 to 1. Okay. So now, if you're in a self-launch, here's the thing for you to think about. If you've got a good enough field to land, I mean, if you got a good enough field, not good enough to land, but if you got a good enough field, let's say you're you're circling a little uh, public use airport uh, somewhere, uh, and you're sitting up here at 2,000 AGL. If it if you have any problem at all with the engine, consider landing and just you know wait for whatever is causing the atmospheric problem to pass, and then as long as the engine starts, consider takeoff later. Okay. Don't insist that all of this, you know, that it has to happen in the air. Okay. But notice that basically what we're doing with this 
is we're setting up for that bottom 3,000 feet that we were talking about with that other curve. If I find one lot worth of lift and I can use it and it gets me back up, I'm a happy camper. Okay, why do we use McCready three or four in uh, on days that everybody's talking about six to eight li not lift? Okay, so the first thing that's going to happen is their centering time. Okay, so the the thermal might actually be, you know, moving at six or eight knots, but the thermal average is three or four because it took time to center. The thermal varies with altitude. Uh, it gets stronger as you get higher. It could be really weak down at the bottom. And if you were searching, you certainly weren't searching at McCready three or four, you were searching at something less. Um, the other one is you know, your range, your glide range with your altitude bands. There is something else to consider and it's kind of showing right here is okay, we glide and here's our thermal. But notice right here, the thermal shifted. And that happens. Uh, we see it a lot out here in the West. I don't know so much uh, when you get back uh, into the flatter part of the country in the lower elevation, but that kind of a shift happens. You know, now you started down here at about three and it went to four and it went to six and, oh, I had to search. Oh, I found it again. Hey, this is seven. And, you know, I make the uh, obligatory call, you know, uh, Yankee seven's got a seven knot thermal over the, uh, you know, over the bend in the creek bed. Of course, all my buddies know where that is, right? You know, and then it tapers down to four knots. Okay, this wasn't a seven knot thermal. Okay, so basically what we're talking about, what's the thermal? It's the total from the bottom to the top, okay? Early in the day, you're gonna have lower climb rates. Middle of the day will be higher climb rates. And then as the day dies, you will have lower climb rates. So you've also got to adjust your McCready expectations accordingly. Now, the key is you're gonna remember that seven knots and there's nothing wrong with that. What you want to do is you want to analyze the flight trace after the flight to see how you really did, to see, you know, uh, what your actual performance was. There's a piece of software that the SSA is offering to our membership called WeGlide. It has a suite of analysis tools. So you put your flight in there like you put it into the OLC, and then it will help you understand your flight. Uh, if you can get the weather models in, and some other data, then it will say, oh, you know, you should have been pushing at McCready 4 here rather than uh, uh, McCready 2 airspeed. You should have been up at a McCready 4 airspeed, or you should have been 10 knots faster, or you, you know, you, your thermal might, you didn't really center this thermal, but the center might have been over here at, uh, you know, a little bit southeast and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So it's got a nice set of tools. Um, I haven't had a chance to work with it very much. If you've got somebody that has in your club, it became available late enough last year that most of the flying, at least in our part of the country, was done. So I haven't been able to, uh, you know, I haven't sat down with it and put some old flights in there to see how that com how their analysis compares to what I remember. But it it exists and it's out there. Okay. What we've been talking about is interthermal, how to improve our interthermal speed. And that's great. Okay. Here's the really interesting extension. All right. So we're going to change gears. We're going to talk about a safety glide. Now, safety glide can be a final glide, but it's a safety glide is any glide over terrain that landing out poses a real problem. I don't want to land here. And notice my little sub thing on this. You're not being conservative when you're flying McCready Zero, and I will show you why. Un unless you're within that last two or three miles home and you're just grasping at straws, never set it for McCready Zero for your final glide. All right. So you need to understand what your instruments are telling you. This is the 
Ventus Polar. Uh, so this is my basic speed to fly polar. You're going to be flying with a computer and you're going to be flying with a speed to fly Vario. The Vario is your speed director. It's going to tell you to fly faster, slower, or things are just right. The computer is going to establish your glide. It's going to, you, you know, it's your glide plan. That's your glide calculator. And then it's providing an indication on your glide slope about how your performance is, how you're progressing with your performance on the glide. Okay. So McCready 4, I should be out here at 87 knots. So it's McCready 4 day. And what I'm doing is I'm going to derate. Let's say that, uh, you know, it's been a four knot day, but I'm now in two knots of sync, or the day has declined to two knots. Take your pick. Okay. And the other one is, is that if I'm in sync, I want to fly faster. So if I'm in lift, the green line, or if I'm sync, red line, I want to fly slower or I want to fly faster. So my speed to fly vario set for McCready 4. It's going to tell me when I'm in sync to fly slower. It's going to tell me in, or I mean, yeah, in sync, fly faster, and in lift, fly slower. Okay. The speed to fly vario knows nothing about altitude, distance, or glide ratio. That's the glide computer's job. The speed to fly vario tells you how to respond to changes in lift and sync reference to the desired McCready setting in the speed to fly vario. Now, the glide computer, notice the purple line, okay? If I draw it through zero, that's the angle, that's the glide angle, in this case, 29 to one, for McCready setting four, okay? So this is gonna establish the glide ratio, and then it's gonna adjust for bugs and ballast, that's your settings. And then the monitor, as you're monitoring it, it's going to adjust the glide ratio that you're achieving based on wind and altitude. This glide monitor doesn't account for lift or sink. That's what the Vario is doing. It takes both of these units to do what we're getting ready to talk about. Okay. Now, one of the things you have to be careful of, if you've got your computer connected to your Vario, many systems will allow the computer to set the McCready value in the Vario. This is probably not what you want on a final glide. And we'll talk about that in a moment. McCready theory assumes that lift and sync balances out over the course of the flight. But when you're on final glide, that is a relatively small segment of the flight. And so the lift and sync may not balance out 50-50 over your final glide. You may have long periods of lift or you may have long periods of sync in your final glide. Okay, so how are we going to accommodate that? So one of the things, this is a repeat of an earlier slide, but it's got some data on it that we're going to be using. The traditional usage is it's a strategy for interthermal speed for McCready is, and both the glide computer and the Vario use the same McCready setting. Now, what we're going to do in this safety glide is we're our strategy here is we're going to separate the computer and the Vario with two different McCready settings. Okay, so we're going to be, you know, we're doing a glide over an uncomfortable terrain or we're doing a final glide. So we set the computer McCready value that will give us a good glide solution. And let's assume that that glide solution is McCready 4. Okay. So we've set the computer. The computer then is going to calculate it, and again, using my Ventus and then dry, it's going to calculate a 49 to 1 glide ratio to a chosen point. You know, we're going to a, we're going to someplace, and we've got it defined because we've told the computer we're going there at McCready 4, okay? 
And it's come back and it said, adjusting for wind, hey, you can make it, all right? Now, the computer is assuming the final glide question from a contest, how fast to go through still air to use up all this aptitude. So it wants to fly 87 knots dry or 99 knots wet. We're on final glide or we're flying over someplace we definitely do not want to land. That's not your question. That 29 to 1 glide ratio is for safety in case there's sink along the way. We're not asking, we don't care what the computer, how fast the computer says we can fly. The question we're answer, asking right now is, let's give it a, a, a McCready 4 or 5 setting and see if it's got a good glide solution. By the way, if it doesn't have a good glide solution, you need to point it in another direction and figure out where else to go. Okay. So the goal is what we want to fly is we want to fly a slower speed that's going to give us a better glide. And we want our guidance at flying that speed to adapt for the lift and sink along the way. So in this case, I'm going to suggest let's set it from 3D2. So that's going to, the airspeed associated with McCready 2, the best glide speed is 72 knots, not 87 knots. And that's going to give us a glide ratio of 36 to 1. So if your computer sets the Vario to 4, then the Vario, your speed director, the thing that's telling you fly faster, fly slower, or fly 72, We'll be making recommendations for McCready 4, not McCready 2. It's going to be constantly complaining that you need to speed up, and you're going to lose the reference for indications of lift or sink reference to McCready 2. Decouple your speed director from the glide computer. Some of the glide computers will allow you to do it. Others, you may have to go, oh, I'm in final glide mode, and manually go in and just tell it not to send the McCready number to the Vario. Depends on the machine or the computer that you've got. Okay. Now, the key with this is that if your progress stays above the glide slope calculated because you're flying a 36 to 1 glide and the computer is thinking you're, you know, that it's it's doing its calculations at 29 to 1, as long as your progress stays above the glide slope calculated by the computer, you're going to make it. Okay. It's real easy. You're going to make it. If you're descending towards the glide slope, in other words, the glide slope is coming down, um, you know, maybe you need to lower the director to McCready 1. And if you're close enough, maybe McCready 0, you know, that'll help you stretch the glide. But you didn't start your final glide or your safety glide at McCready 0. You started it. Your speed, you started on in the computer at McCready 4 and you started it in the Vario at McCready 2. You want to keep the glide computer on McCready 4. That's where, the, that's where you're going to make your decisions about go or no go. In other words, divert to an airport or another landing location. Okay. Now, let's go play with this. So in this case, the conditions are good enough to have a safety glide solution at McCready 4. The computer establishes the clearance plane. That's the purple line. Okay, that's the 29 to 1 glide ratio. The Vario is going to set McCready 2. That's the green line. Okay. And at McCready 2, it's going to want you to fly at 72 knots as opposed to what the computer is going to recommend at 87 knots. Okay. The gap between these two lines is your safety margin. And notice as you get closer and closer to home, that safety margin decreases. But as you get closer and closer to home, you don't need as much safety margin. Or you get closer and closer to getting across this unlandable area. You don't need as much of a safety margin. Okay. Now, you're going to use the glide slope indicator on the computer because it's going to show you staying above the required glide slope and if you start getting down to it, this is where I said you may need to adjust up here. So, for instance, we're getting closer 
you know, we're starting to get closer. We're going to reduce this to McCready 1. This glide angle is now 41 to 1. This is still at 29 to 1, but notice that we've picked up a little bit in our gap. Okay. So by setting the vario to, let's say, a worse McCready number and flying the airspeed associated with that McCready number, we're trying to stay above the purple line. That's our goal, stay above the purple line. If we do that, we will cross this bad stretch or we will make it home at whatever altitude we've decided we want to arrive at home with. If you really had it to go to zero, okay, what would you, where, if, if we had, if we were flying through sync and it was a long stretch of sync and we've had to reduce this more and more to stay above the glide slope set at McCready 4, where would we have been back here had we set the computer and the speed director, the Vario, at McCready zero. We would not have had this margin all the way. We would not have had any safety gap. You know, basically we'd be getting up in here and we'd be screwed. Okay. Now, most speed to fly varios do not have a uh, speed to fly number, the, the airspeed on it. So one of the things you may want to consider doing is creating a small chart that has the McCready setting to air to speed to fly airspeed. So that, for instance, if you, uh, you know, it's McCready 2 and the airspeed is 72 knots. McCready 4 and it's 87 knots. But have that next to the Vario so that if you have, so that when you change the McCready setting up there, You've got your target airspeed in front of you. Just a thought. Yes, I uh, well, I have a, I have a display on my computer that I use that for. Okay. So this one we're talking about McCready values. So here's our L over D. We got feet per mile and all of that. So at three knots, you'd fly 80 miles an hour, or 80 knots for three. Uh, McCready three, you'd fly 80. And yeah, if you're wet, you're flying 92, okay? But in both cases, 32 to one, 34 to one, so you're roughly 33 to one, okay? Now, you wanna think about it. If you think you'll achieve 43 knots on your final glide, then McCready three, you know, because we might stop in thermal. So our average for that final glide might be 43 knots given how long we normally stay in a thermal, that kind of thing. Okay. The little chart that I was talking about putting beside your, uh, your Vario are the first two columns. And you probably really don't need to go above the pre-4, you know, especially if you're talking about for final glide. And if it's that dicey coming back in, I don't know that you'd be flying wet. You might be dropped, you might have dropped your water already. So you may not want to bother trying to have two columns there with uh, speeds for the wet. Okay. Now, <clears throat> McCready 29 to 1. Okay. This sounds like a reasonable safety glide. That's McCready 4. Uh, if you go fly in the Alps, the instructors over there, uh, according to some of the folks I've talked to, are saying that you need to be planning for a 20 to 1 glide ratio plus your reserve at the airport or your landing site. Okay. That's uh, that's McCready 8 for my Ventus. We'll take a look at that in a moment. So for safety-related glide calculations, expect to use McCready values that are much, much higher than those you'd use for speed, for thermal, or for other considerations. The... Uh, Reason for this is our gliders are so finely optimized. They sink so little in still air. But so if we get into sink, that base that can have a disastrous result on our overall glide ratio or glide angle. Okay. 
So that eight, to, that McCready eight, there's your 20 to one. That's not saying fly 111 knots. That's saying you want to maintain a 20, you want to have a 20 to one clearance. Uh, you may be flying McCready two airspeed or McCready three airspeed, but you need to have clearance for 20 to one glide to get back to wherever it is you're trying to get. That's the point that they're attempting to make when they say that. Now, we talked, I mentioned that how highly optimized we are, how highly optimized our aircraft are. Okay, so my Venice is a early 80s design, so, but it was one of the first to use uh, an airfoil that took it, that took advantage of the material science that carbon fiber brought. So her performance is actually higher than most of the gliders for that era. She's also more highly optimized than most gliders from that era. Now, it's only a few percent, but that's the case. All right, so I'm going to take the Venice B Polar. There's my Venice B dry polar, okay? I'm going to drop this for two knots worth of sink. All right. My tangent is now out here. My best glide speed just went to 72 knots. However, if I take 72 knots and I go over here to four, I went from a 43 to one glider right there to an 18 to one glider right here. Okay. So this chart is different from all of the previous. This chart is a netto chart. So this column is not glider sync or vario numbers or anything like that. This is air mass movement. So for one knot down, and I'm flying 63 knots, my glide ratio is 25 to one. At two knots down, I'd be flying at 72 knots and my glide ratio is 18 to one. My vario would be showing 2.6 right here, and my vario would be showing a minus four right here. Okay, but the air mass is only move is moving one or two. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Let's assume that the pilot is desperate and he's flying at a McCready zero setting. So how bad's his glide? It's terrible. Right here, one knot, his glide ratio is 25. Yeah, 25. And you're going to want to speed, and it's going to try to tell you to speed up to 63 knots. Two knot sync, it really is 18. Okay. So, what does it take to, how do you deal with sustained one knot sync all the way to the landing? Okay, so this table is telling you. With one knot, you've got to maintain 25, uh, a 25 to one glide ratio all the way home. All right, I'm going to back up three knot, uh, three slides. This slide. Where is 25 to one? Okay, we won't argue one number. That says that if you don't have, if you put McCready six in your computer, you've got sustained one knot sync, you'd have to put McCready 6 in your computer and then have it say, you can make it from here in order to have a good solution. So when you've got widespread sustained sync, you've got to be on top of this quickly. Now, for that sustained two knot sync, so you've got a long time and you're at minus four on your vario. That says you want 18 to one. Again, we'll back up a couple. So 18 to one, we're down here in the nine to 10 range is what it's gonna take to get you home or to get you across that rough patch that you don't wanna land in. This is These considerations are why Trying to fly McCready Zero on a safety glide gets you in trouble. 
Okay, so the key here is don't set your final glide up at McCready zero and say, oh, I'm being conservative and I've got it made. Crank that number up and see where it goes to say, okay, you won't make it here. Back up one number and then see how things look. Okay. That gets you something that is actionable. That gets you something that you can see the trends in time to make decisions. That's the secret. All right, we're coming in. So this graph is based on AS, uh, I'm sorry, I said ASW29, ASG29. Uh, for those of you that would prefer it, it's an ASG27-18 or slash 18. Okay, never mind. I put the wrong thing right there, sorry. All right, now, if you blow a final glide every once in a while using McCready 3, that doesn't mean that you have to use McCready 5 or 10 to stay safe. Um, there, uh, John Cochran developed a statistical model, and okay, this was when he was still flying in Illinois, not flying in California, and when he had his discus, not necessarily, well, this says this graph is Bruce 29, okay. Anyway, so the solid blue line, this curve right here, assume for every mile that you fly, you've got a 33% chance of losing 100 feet or more, and a 2% chance of losing 200 feet or more. The probability gives this curve, and it shows how many feet over here on the side is how many feet above a McCready zero you would have to have, let's say out here at 10 miles in order to make it home. And that works like 600 feet over a McCready zero number. Okay. What that does is that gives you basically uh, a 2% chance of landing out. So at one mile right here, you need to be 200 feet above. At 10 miles, we don't take, it's not linear, so we don't take 10 times 200 and say 2,000 feet. It's basically the square root of 10, because of the miles, times the 200 feet, or about 600 feet. Okay. Anybody want to do square roots in their head while they're flying? I know I don't. And then 20 miles out, you're up around. Instead of needing 4,000 feet, if you did it linearly, it works out to about 900 feet. I'm still not interested in doing square roots in my head on final glide coming in. You know, not something I would enjoy. There's another rule that you, uh, but anyway, so basically what's going to happen here is if we play this game for blue, is if the conditions are what I described, that generate this blue uh, curve. If we were to come in at McCready 3, so in his 29, 35 to 1, it'd be lower in my uh, uh, Ventus, and we add a constant, we take the McCready 3 setting and we add 200 feet, 250 feet, okay? Then we're out here, that's the dashed line. So notice out to about 12 miles, okay, closer than about four miles, it's keeping you way higher than you need to be, but at four miles, you should be able to see the airport and see, or see your landing site and see the solution as to whether or not you're gonna make it. You don't need the computer to tell you anymore. If we're out here in the six to 10 mile range, this is right on. And then if we're above uh, say 11 miles plus, it's going to give us a little excess altitude. Okay. Doesn't bother me in the least. Um, and so I did the arithmetic, uh, well, arithmetic, I did the math. And based on my Ventus for uh, coming in from 20 miles out and uh, at 43 to 1, so I said it's same McCready zero, right? So at 43 to 1, I ran his number and I wanted an 8,000 foot arrival at my home airport. My home airport's 7,000 MSL. I wanted to get there with a 1,000 foot, uh, foot pattern. 
So that says at 43 to one at 20 miles out that I want to be at uh, 10, eight, and then I add the 900 to it. So I want to be at 11, eight. And that's basically a 33 to one glide in my Ventus. If I do the McCready, that was the square root method. If I do the McCready method, McCready three and 250 feet for an 8,000 foot arrival at my home airport, I'm flying 35 to one. That says I need that says I need to leave uh, 20 miles out at 11.5 plus 250, so 11.750 compared to 11.8 using the square root method. Ooh, I like that. Okay, so play with the numbers with your plane, with your glider. Um, but you know this is this is assuming one mile long of sink. Uh, every once in a while kind of thing. This one is assuming two miles of sync. So it says use McCready 5 and plus 300. So in his glider, it's down to 30 to 1. All right. The whole point here is you can use these solutions. You can also use one. Uh, I was given a rule, rule of thumb a long time ago that said, uh, you know, final glide for whatever the, uh, you know, whatever it said I needed for final glide plus a thousand feet for every 10 miles out. Uh, and that works out to a probably about 20, maybe 30 miles. But even out here, you get much further out than about 20 miles. And all of a sudden, the altitudes that it's telling you put you up in a class A airspace. So while that's a, a comfortable, easy to remember rule of thumb, if you're using it, you got to be sure that it does that it works for uh, uh, it works for the environment that you're working with. Now, the the key here is uh, you know what can go wrong. You know, I described a uh, convergence line that I got into. You know, had a river of lift. It wasn't real strong. It was only one or two knots. But we're ta what we're talking about here is a river of sink, one or two knots. Okay. Don't believe they're out there? Follow me around sometime. I have a way to find them. I'm not sure why. Okay. Um, having the sink all the way home over a period of 10 or 20 miles is not real likely. Uh, having it be not there at all is sink not be there at all is also not real likely so truth is somewhere in between and it depends on the day the uh, basically if you wanted to uh to play the game uh like i say if you're running with that one knot of sink so you're seeing the minus two in my Venice, the minus two and a half, or the two knots of sync in my Venice, seeing the minus four, that you're better off to play the game. Set it at McCready five, set it at McCready three plus 250 or McCready five plus 300. Okay. Take, create the tables for your glider and work out the numbers so that you have something to make decisions with. So. The uh, if you want a lower probability of not making it, raise the McCready number. If you're willing to take a little bit more risk, because that will shift the curves up, the the dashed lines. If you are willing to take a little more probability of not making it, use a lower McCready for the two miles or the you know the two miles and two knots or and the one knot sink. You can go a little lower. In all cases. I try to train our cross-country pilots when I'm doing the mentoring so that when they're in the five-mile range out from the airport, that they can make the decision looking out because you know how the plane's flying and you can see the glide angles coming back. And our airport is easy to see from five miles out. Actually, it's easy to see from much further out, but five miles makes a real nice, comfortable place to make decisions. 
When you're dealing with this, the cost of not making it to the desired landing point or the acceptable probability of not making it. All right, what, show, what value should we use in the real world? We're talking about your computer setting because that's the one that's gonna set the glide ratio. Okay, that's the one that's gonna set the uh, angle that you're coming back in on. How you set the vario is up to you. How you fly it is up to you. And the real answer to this, you know, it's the standard engineering answer to any question. And it depends. It depends on the cost of not making it to your landing spot and the consequence of, you know, and consequently the probability of not making, you know, what you what can you accept? So casual cross country. You're flying over good fields. The cost of a land out versus making it to the airport is inconvenient. So, you know, you're in halfway decent conditions, set the computer in STF to fly somewhere in the three to four range, week one to two knot lift, build up your margin, set the computer to three or four rather than two, and the la rather than the McCready two that the last thermal would say, and then set the speed to fly at a somewhat lower value so that you are flying a better glide angle or a better glide ratio back to the airport than the computer is computing. For casual, it's inconvenient. For contest, over you know you're flying over good terrain. The cost is you know severe loss of points, but you know didn't break the glider, didn't hurt the plane. You know, in halfway decent conditions like we're looking, McCready three or four is probably good enough. All right. The um, remember when I say McCready three or four, that's what the computer is computing your glide angle on. Remember, you're not flying McCready three or four airspeed. You are likely flying a McCready two airspeed, and you're managing your performance against the McCready three or four glide slope. If you're in rougher terrain, the cost of a land out can be glider damage. But maybe it's you know, but not likely uh, personal injury. Okay. Uh, so you may want to run the uh, McCready and McCready five and the Vario something slower. And you want to fly faster to get out of the sink. Okay. If you're crossing totally unlandable terrain, this is where failing to make your goal can mean injury or worse. I mean, you know, we're past worrying about breaking the airplane. We're worried about breaking you. You may find that your McCready is eight or higher with the with your Vario set much slower. And again, you got to fly faster to get out of sync. Okay. Again, you're setting up for these numbers. Um, you know, like on my glider, I showed it back to you a couple minutes ago. You know, you could be flying, uh, you know, McCready 8, 9, and 10. Or not, you're not flying McCready 8, 9, and 10. You're using McCready 8, 9, and 10 to set your glide slope. You're flying at a lower McCready. Uh, airspeed in order to have a better glide slope back or better glide angle back. Now, the techniques that I've been talking about this evening, I've been using since about 2019. Uh, flying into my home field, I normally start at a McCready 4 in the computer and a McCready 3 for the variable or vario. McCready 3 and values of McCready 3 for the computer and McCready 2 for the burial are not unusual. It just depends on the kind of day it is. Most of my final glides start about 20 miles out, but I've had final glides from 50 plus miles out. For the part of the country that I fly in, that's not unusual. Again, you've got to understand what are the capabilities, what are the conditions that you fly in at your location or the places that you're going to go. Um, it would probably, I, I flew one summer, I was working back on the East Coast and I went out and flew at Skyline Soaring at Front Royal, Virginia. And that's not a bad place to fly, but boy, it sure felt different than flying out here. And I was talking to a gentleman that uh, flew regularly at Skyline and he came out here and he was telling me how terrifying it was to fly out here. So, you know, it's different. You're, you have to adjust, you have to adapt. Um, 
late in the 2022 season, a friend of mine and I happened to be returning to the airport from the same general direction. It, it was because we, we weren't flying the same flight together. We just happened to use the same turn point for our final turn towards home. He was flying an ASG-29 and I was flying my ASH-26. So, you know, not too far off. I mean, you know, the 29 is still better performance, but it's not too far off. And we found ourselves near each other about 40 miles out from the home airport at roughly the same altitude. We were separated by a couple of miles. We weren't attempting to fly together. He flies faster than I do, so he increased his lead, and, you know, as we flew home. I have no idea how he manages his final glide, but he normally makes it home, so his method works for him. I normally make it at home as well, so my method works for me. About 20 miles out, I decided I wanted to bank a little more altitude. I was looking at my numbers and stuff like that, and 20 miles out, and I was going to be a little more comfortable if I had a little more altitude. I found a nice thermal, added roughly 1,000 feet. You know, it was only, you know, a couple of minutes to, to get my, to get that 1,000 feet in my altitude bank. My friend continued on without stopping when I got back to the airport. I had almost exactly an extra thousand feet over what the computer indicated I would have had prior to that last thermal. I snickered as I opened the spoilers, you know, I'm letting down the pattern altitude, you know, well, okay, I really didn't need it. So what? It was a nice low stress final glide. And that counts for something. And the key is when you're using the values like we were looking at the McCready 3 plus 250, the McCready 5 plus 300, we can't, you know, you calculate those things out. You'll routinely get to your goal on your safety glide with gobs of extra altitude. And yes, that's the point. There's no reason or, you know, yeah, there are reasons. I'm sorry. I don't mean to say it that way. You want to try to, you know, if you can manage your energy coming back so you don't have to land a half mile from the end of the runway or you don't have to land a half mile before the rocks end. Okay, modern McCready theory. We're wrapping up and we're not doing too bad. At any moment, one of the things you're gonna ask yourself is what is the weakest lift I would take right now? You set your McCready value to that. So if you're cruising now, your overall McCready settings. I made a little recommendation earlier. If you're down at zero, it's an imminent land out. You take anything. In fact, I would I would say you're not setting McCready settings. You're doing other things that are far more important. If you're saying I would take a McCready one, you're desperate. If you're saying I would take a McCready two, you're probably being cautious. McCready three and maybe four is every day. Depending on where you fly, McCready 4 and higher may be aggressive. You know, what kind of mood am I in? All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Take any lift that's stronger than that McCready value that you decided upon. Okay. If you, if the lift decreases below that number, leave. Go find something else. The only time that that's not true is when your only choice is stay in this lift or land right there in that field you already have picked out. In that case, you're taking anything you can and you're going to leave claw marks in the sky from your fingernails because you're trying so hard not to land. The key with that, hit your bingo altitude, make the decision, put the gear down and you know get yourself configured for landing and land. Set your bingo altitude before you get into that last before you get into that last thermal, you don't want to you don't want to try to decide what that altitude is. Your bingo altitude. Make the decision before, and when you hit it, you make the decision. You're not trying to decide is this the right altitude. <clears throat> you want to apply your corresponding block speed. You almost never want to apply best L over D, and you want to adjust smoothly for the lift and sink ahead. McCready depends on the weather and the terrain ahead. You steadily reduce the McCready value as you get lower. Remember my three band model for the, uh, the atmosphere. 
If I'm up high and running like a scalded cat, then my McCready is up nice and high. As I come down lower and I start saying, oh, okay, I, I'm going to be less picky and even less picky. Steadily increase the McCready as you get higher. Leave bad lift when it's safe. There are times to use bad lift. And when it's safe, leave. When you're doing your, uh, your glide calculations for safety glide, use a much higher McCready value. Make all of this automatic. Uh, speed is, most light, is mostly about climbing better, avoiding the searching for lift. It's reading the weather, gliding in lift, and avoiding getting stuck. The number one thing that slows me down is I put off getting serious about thermaling. I pass up a thermal I should have taken, and I get myself stuck, and I'm there grinding and grinding and grinding, you know, maybe on the edge of a little ridge waiting for a thermal to kick off uh, so that I can finally get back up, you know. So the my self-improvement over the next couple of years is to avoid getting stuck as much as I do. And then the other one is learn to thermal better, learn to climb better. Center, learn to identify where the center is, get yourself in the center, and then manage your climb better in the center. So our summary this evening, all models are wrong, some are useful. McCready is just another model. The theory usage evolves over time. What we use today uh, is enabled by the equipment, the electronics that we carry in the aircraft, the performance of our aircraft, and the very design and capabilities of our aircraft and the ability to increase the mass of the plane, the basic performance of the aircraft. All of that has evolved and so, since McCready theory was developed, since Paul developed the theory. And so therefore the usage has evolved. It can help you fly faster, efficiently, and effectively. 70 knot average cross-country speeds come from efficient thermaling, gliding and lift, and not in booming thermals and mad glides. And don't use McCready 1 or McCready 0 on your glide computer for your final glide. That brings us to questions. Awesome, Dave. Uh, I think this is the at least the second time I've seen this, and it's starting to make sense. I appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, two questions left here. Um, one of them is, I'm unsure why flying at McCready zero setting is bad. Don't we get the best glide ratio at the zero setting? You do get the best glide ratio at the zero setting. The problem is that it doesn't give you any margin if you run into sync, if you run in, if the winds change and you run into the headwind. So the problem with McCready zero is you have no margin. That's why you would set your computer at say McCready three or four, and then set your Vario at, so McCready three or four, like in my glider McCready three, I think I've been saying it's 72 knots and four is 80 or 80 something. So let's say McCready three at 72 knots. All right, if I set my McCready two uh, in my Vario, then I'm using the glide angle for McCready 2, which is better than the glide angle at McCready 3. McCready 3 is telling me I can make it, and McCready 4 is giving me the, uh, McCready 2 on the Vario is giving me the margin above that I can make it, so that I've got room to make decisions before things get bad. That's why you don't, that's why you don't set everything to zero from 20 miles out because you have no margins at that point. Okay. The last question we have here, and this was all the way back at the beginning, and I think you know the answer to this, but if not, we can research it and find out after. Uh, the question is, is we glide integrated into the proving grounds task that you mentioned at the beginning? We're working on that in our, uh, at our club. Uh, we have two folks that are uh, myself and another member of our club, Brian Price, are working with the SSA Cross Country Committee, Cross Country Training Committee, and Brian has taken on the task to integrate our proving grounds uh, tasks into WeGlide 
so that we can use that to help uh, the beginning cross country people or the people that are flying those tasks to do the analysis post flight. Perfect. Now, uh, if the, now, wait a minute. If the question is, has the club in Canada integrated WeGlide in general with the overall proving grounds tool? I don't know. Okay. The last one uh, here is just a comment, and uh, I think this is worth mentioning. It says that I think people can safely better understand McCready and also ballasting by using Condor. And uh, I second that. I think that's a great way to test this out and understand it without spending a lot of money. Yeah, I think that works too. That's all I have on my side, Dave. All righty. Well, we have reached the end today. And I said approximately two and a half hours, and I beat it by a little bit. Um, next time, March 22nd, same bat channel, same bat time. We'll be talking about collision avoidance technology. So we'll be wandering off into transponders and farms and those kinds of things. I look forward to seeing everybody there. I appreciate everyone who has stayed with us and I appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you very much. And uh, Frank, it's over to you.